and it was just, it was really hard waking up, being 13, being told that I would probably never be able to play basketball again, never be able to walk again, talk again, or do anything that I used to do. Hey what's going on guys, welcome back to another video with Trends. This is your boy Billy, and today we're going to be doing a closet tour of one of the most inspirational people that I know. He also happens to be one of my best friends, his name is Emmanuel Mavridakis, and apart from that, let's get started. Okay guys, so we're in Manny's room. Um, this is the first senior cabinet that we could see as we walk in. Um, so Maddie, tell me a bit about like what was the first pair of Yeezys you bought and what kind of got you into really Yeezys essentially? So the first pair of Yeezys I personally got were the OG 750s right here, which I've completely destroyed. So these were the first pairs of Yeezys I personally got. I got them a few months after they came out, but in my opinion, out of all the 700 uh, 750s, these are the shittiest quality Yeezy ever produced. Really? The quality is awful. Fortunately for me, the zipper wasn't, uh, did not break, but I had seen through uh, Twitter and a lot of people complaining on Adidas, a lot of people had the zipper break. So I was fortunate with that, but to be honest, they're not very comfortable. They're, they're a hype shoe to have, but it's not really like a go-to shoe. Like, so these really were your first them. like hype Those shoes. Those were my first, first sort of hype shoes. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, so we see that you have almost every Yeezy that came out. Um, you know, looking up on the cabinet, we do see a lot of off-white. So starting off here, um, we have the Air Max off-whites. What can you tell me about this shoe? How did you get them? And you know, what do you think that's really special about so it? So these are actually top three favorite shoes in my collection. They're super comfortable. They're really nice in my opinion. Uh, I actually purchased these used. So that's why the, the, um, the bottom of the shoe isn't as icy as it usually is. But I got these for 700. And in my opinion, I mean, I, I destroyed them a bit more, but when I first got them, they were like nine, 9.5 on 10. So I was really happy to get them for 700. And now I see them going for like 1400 and higher like on StockX, which I find is insane, insane. But out of all the off-white Nike shoes that have come out, I find that even though the Jordan 1s are super nice, this is one of the nicest shoe models and colorways that have come out. And what's interesting is that you being in a wheelchair and having a lot of shoes, your shoes actually, never they dirty. never touch exactly. the ground, right? So, yeah, so basically that's a, that's a huge, huge thing. They never really get dirty, I mean. Awesome. Transferring in and out of the car, sometimes I'll get some dirt on it, but I mean, you could keep my shoes, shoes are dead forever. stock. Yeah, exactly. My shoes are dead stock all the time. Awesome. So it's really cool with that. So another very iconic pair that we could find are the Off White UNCs. Um, so you guys, you got them when they came out, right? Uh, I got them a bit after they came out. Okay. That was these were the first like really expensive pair of shoes I personally bought because. I found that with the Nike Off-White collab, I found it was amazing what uh, Virgil did with it. And I really like the Chicago ones, but Those are I mean, I'm not going to spend $3,000. They're at like $4,000. They're at a ridiculous price. price right now. So I personally saw this colorway and I found it was a beautiful colorway with the UNC OG, whatever. And these were the first shoes I really spent a lot of money on in my whole collection. So these for sure, like, have a certain connection for me because these sort of helped me get more into the game and sort of see the potential of buying expensive shoes and how much they've increased. Like I bought these for like $600 less than they're going for right now. I think I can't remember the right, exact number, right. but it really helped me see how with sneakers and clothing, there's a huge market for people who want to resell and like yeah, buy. Yeah. So another iconic uh, pair of shoes that you have in your collection are the Off-White Hyperdunks. So you used to play basketball and then you actually probably used to have a pair of older Hyperdunks. So what was it like, you know, getting, you know, a newer pair of Hyperdunks that was also inspired um, by Off-White and, um, you know, created by Virgil? So this I found was like super, super cool because 
it was like my two biggest interests in one. So basically, mm -hmm. you have the hype beast, like the hype with the Virgil off white, and you have the basketball shoe with the hyper dunk design. So mm -hmm. one of my favorite basketball shoes I've ever worn were the hyper dunk lunar loons. I believe they were called, yeah. and I was obsessed with those. So when these first came out, it was the most underrated pair in the whole collection. And I remember like people were selling them. For Ridiculously cheap. Like I bought this pair for five hundred dollars. Yeah. Which and now is they're like reselling for like for over, yeah, yeah, over, like 1K. Over, over a K. Yeah. So I I found that I got a really good steal on these and I find they're just a really clean shoe. They're nice and I find it's awesome how finally like, the basketball shoe is kind of like mixed in hype and mm -hmm. mixed in with the hype as well. It's cool because you saw a lot of players like Devin Booker, um, you know, TJ P PJ Tucker, exactly, yeah. um, playing in these Play shoes, in these, yeah, and yeah. It, it really helped not only with the marketing but also with like the whole uh, you know story behind it. Exactly, the shoes. exactly. So yeah. that, that I found. Okay, so moving on, it seems like we're at your second cabinet. Um, right off the bat, I see some very iconic shoes. We got the Travis Scotts, both of them. Um, we also have, you know, Balenciagas, some, uh, you know, Supreme Vans, um, and uh, amazing other things. What are some shoes from this cabinet that really have changed your life, essentially? So, it really changed my life for me. If we start off just the top on the right. left. These ones? On the left, yeah. So, these are just regular Rick Owen runners, but these were my first like real designer shoe that I've ever had. So these were, for me, this is what I really started getting into in about 2015, 16. These really, really mean a lot to me because it was like one of the first shoes that I got like high end. It's also, it's crazy how like, it's Adidas that made these shoes. Exactly, right? exactly. Like, no one would expect exactly. Adidas making a shoe like that. It's crazy. So these are the Buscemi 100 millimeters, I believe. Wow. So I was fortunate enough to actually get these gifted from John Buscemi, who's the actual designer of the shoe. So mm -hmm. I was super fortunate through, uh, through some family friends to be able to get this pair gifted to me. And it was always a pair I really wanted because I love the little sort of lock it has on the back. Does it happen on both shoes? It has it on both shoes, yeah. And if you notice right here, it has the little, the little key in the pocket. Oh wow! Okay. So I found that was like super, super, a super cool part about the shoe. Moving on in the cabinet, um, we have a pair of three iconic Jordans. So which one out of these three really touched you? So for me personally, I mean, I know all the hype around the Travs right now, but mm -hmm. out of these three Jordans, personally, the black toe ones at the far left right there have a very big impact because these were my first pair of Jordans I've ever bought, which are I think they're the. 2013 I think okay. black toe ones so basically these were my first Jordans and also these were one of the shoes that really got me into the hype and really showed me how there's there's money to make out of this because I got these for like 200 and now I retail, see them right? going for yeah I got them for retail and I see them going up for like five six hundred over six hundred dollars like but unfortunately which really sucks is I unfortunately lost the box these? So if you know anybody that has the box or like has a box or is <laughs> yeah. just selling box like that, please feel free to like DM me, I'll buy it, whatever. Okay. I'm, I'm looking for <laughs> desperately the box for these shoes. Sounds good. So moving on, I see that you have a ball in your cabinet. Um, what can you tell me about yeah, it? Yeah, there's a very interesting story about that. So you just pass it to me. So this ball is a is a three-point contest money ball game used, and basically this is for the All-Star Game in Toronto in 2016, so it was the first one that's ever been in Canada. And this ball is signed by both East and West All-Stars. So like, here you have Kobe Bryant, it was wow. his last All-Star Game. Crazy. And iconic legend, you have crazy signatures like Kevin Durant, LeBron, Russell Westbrook. Kawhi Leonard, Russell Westbrook, The James whole Harden. squad this is on West, there. This is Westbrook right here. You have Clay too somewhere. Right here, yeah, Clay, all those guys. So basically, I was fortunate enough to be gifted through family, friends, and a foundation that helped me go to the whole All-Star Weekend and helped me watch the dunk contest, the mm -hmm. point contest, the game, 
And I was fortunate enough to be present for all that. And it was really cool because it was the first time it was in Canada. So that played a big role, especially with the whole basketball in my story. And I was really happy meeting everybody because they were all so like positive and like mm -hmm. all seemed to be like so humble and nice. And it was really cool to see that mm -hmm. people in that position that are like famous and stuff mm -hmm are still down to earth, earth and not yeah. like snobs and stuff. So that was, I found was really- Well, especially really NBA players, right? Because a lot yeah, of them exactly. came from nothing. Exactly, so, so I that, found that awesome. Mm -hmm. So what's your favorite um, item in your whole collection? So in my whole collection, I mean, from a basketball perspective, I think it would be between these KD6s, one of one colorway. Wow. That were huge. game used, signed by Kevin Durant. They're size 18. I was fortunate to get them gifted from Kevin Durant himself in uh, Toronto. Wow. And yeah. this game you signed KD jersey when he played for the Thunder. Signed on the back. To Emmanuel. So between And it says those to two, Emmanuel on it too. That's Yeah, that's so this crazy. was game used and this was game used as well. Okay, so moving on to uh, your little Supreme um, accessory collection. Um, I, off the bat, I already see a few uh, pieces that are very, you know, iconic, um, such as the uh, Supreme chopsticks and also the um, the speaker, um, the Bluetooth speaker. Um, what can you tell me about this little collection and how long did it take you to build up? So I've been building this little collection. I mean, it's not that big, but mm -hmm. I've been building it since like I don't know, 2016, from when I first started really getting aggressive into it. And I have to say, personally, like for me, like I'm a sucker for all these like little stupid Tiny accessories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you have like the Supreme I have the lozenges, I have the cough band drops. Aids, I have the RC car too, which. And did you I did you ever try any of the the chair? I I have actually ordered twelve boxes of those, and I only right. have two left. They're, so you ate ten boxes. Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. And what about? Are you ever gonna? You I'm know, gonna use the band aid soon. But does I'm it say Supreme get, on the actual yep. band aid? Wow. I'm waiting to get like a gnarly cut on my face. That's like, crazy. I bet you a lot of people would like pretend to have cuts and they put one here. Yeah, for sure. Branding for sure, Supreme. For sure. And like mm. even I at my cottage, I have the raft. Okay, right, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, awesome. I'm, I'm a real sucker for like the little accessories and stuff like that. So we got to see everything that you have in your closet. You have some incredible stuff, um, but uh, obviously we know you have an incredible story, so we'd like to hear more about it. Perfect. So let's go. Of course. All right, so basically in 2013, I was unfortunately in a very bad car accident where I was riding my ATV at my country house, and unfortunately a car was speeding and hit me, putting me into a two-week coma with eight broken ribs, punctured lung, T1, T2 collision in the spinal cord, massive brain trauma, scratches all over my body, and yeah, that's it. Um, Basically, I was not supposed to survive the accident. The first 72 hours, doctors had told my friends and family that it's not likely that I make it. Um, I've been training a lot ever since the accident. I train now six days a week at a ther private therapy clinic where I do more advanced therapies that the military even uses. And that has really been helping me to get to my goal of walking again and playing basketball again and I'm very close to it. Right now I'm activated up to my knees, whereas when I first had my accident, I was classified as a quadriplegic because my left arm was paralyzed. And my injury is actually from the chest down, but now it's like it's from the knees down. So all I'm working on for now is strengthening my knees and working on the flexion in it. What happened was I was exiting my property on the ATV and a car was speeding at 160 on a road of 60 on my country road and he had hit my ATV from the side so luckily it wasn't directly on or else the ATV would have probably crushed me so thankfully that didn't happen but I was immediately thrown off the ATV my helmet had fell, fallen off I'd flown 75 feet in the air 75 feet across and as I said I was rushed to the hospital and it was just, it was really hard waking up, being 13, being told that I would probably never be able to play basketball again, never be able to walk again, talk again, or do anything that I used to do. 
So my friends were devastated when they figured out that I couldn't play. I was in this tragic car accident. They were all devastated and all of them showed me a bunch of support by visiting me to the hospital. They came to see me, they wrote letters, wrote messages, they brought me gifts, food, stuff like that, and stuff that really helped me feel like happy and positive. And they really helped me stay positive. And honestly, without a lot of my friends and family, I don't think I'd be where I am today. And uh, most importantly, how did your parents react? So my parents were devastated because the first 72 hours, doctors had said to them, like, we don't think your son's gonna make it. It was a very, 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 very bad accident. And they didn't think that I'd be able to make it. And if I did make it, they were convinced that I'd be sort of a quadriplegic and not be able to have control of my body for the rest of my life. So for them, even to this day, it's really hard for them to see. And I find that even though it's not their fault, at times they blame themselves for it. But for them, it was really, really hard. So to sort of fill in the gaps from not being able to do as many as the sports that I used to do and stuff like that, I stay busy with training six days a week after school. Um, I started my own sort of company, Mav Kicks, which is buying and selling shoes and clothing, which takes up a lot of my time. Studying takes a lot of my time as well. And just hanging out with friends, like, aside from the chair and nothing crazy crazy has changed besides the fact that i can't play basketball and sports i enjoy but aside from that i do a lot of the stuff that i used to do and i just stay positive every day i get a bit better and coming out of the hospital coming back home going back to school is one of the hardest experiences i have ever had because i went back into school but i missed half of the school year already so unfortunately i had to sort of not redo the year but do everything I missed. So I was unfortunately misplaced from my grade and put in the grade below with kids that I didn't really know. So that was really hard for me. And just everything else was really hard at first, like even getting into my bed. Coming out of the hospital, I had a lift that would literally just lift me and put me in the bed. And I felt really restrained to what I could do. In the house, I couldn't really get food out of the fridge. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't do anything that I used to be able to do. And that was really, really hard for me. But I had a lot of support from my friends. They would visit me constantly. They'd motivate me to get better. And from there up to now, I'm almost completely autonomous. The only thing I can't really do is stairs. And everything seems to be in the right direction right now. And I'm hopefully going to be walking soon. When I first found out that I'd be able to maybe get better, I right away put all my energy into it. And I really placed myself in a position where all I was thinking about was training, 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 and getting better, better, better. So basically, I had started with Marie Enfant, which is the public system from the hospital. I went there, I stayed there for eight months doing physiotherapy, learning how to speak again, learning how to do regular things, gain back my autonomy. And after that, I really started improving when I started at a private clinic called Neurofeedback. So there was where I really started seeing my full potential in improvement. And right now I'm working at a clinic called Neuroconcept where every time I train, I feel stronger and I feel like I'm capable of doing more and more things. So a lot of the training I was doing when I was at Marie Enfant was just regaining autonomy, mobility, stuff like that. So a lot of it would just be like stretches, doing certain activities that would help me get stronger, both physically and mentally. But up to now, now where I train six days a week, basically on Mondays, I will be doing the FES bike, which is like a stationary bike with electrical stimulate, stimulants on my uh, legs, uh, core and back. I'll be doing something called the Geo, which is a sort of treadmill which I'm suspended from that also has the electric stim pads. On Wednesday, I'll be doing like CrossFit training, so boxing, like pull ups, uh, deadlift weights, stuff like that. On Thursday, I'll be doing walking with like a walker, so that's just me 100% standing on my own walking, just with a bit of assistance to complete the movement with my knee. 
Then Friday, I'll be doing something called the aim, the rewalk, sorry, which is a complete robotic sort of machine that I go into, which I initiate the movement through my hip, and then it completes the movement with the knee. I was first discharged from Mount Enfant Rehabilitation Center. They kind of told me like, okay, this is your wheelchair, you're gonna have the rest of your life like this. So uh, obviously it's not the best mentality to have. So my mom right away contacted a few fundraisers and she managed to partner with one of them called the Melio Foundation which is the main foundation with Marie Enfant and Saint Justin, which helps raise money for families and kids who can't exactly afford certain trainings and certain equipment that would help benefit their life. So for example, uh, in like 2015, we raised enough money to get three FES bikes for the hospital. We raised enough money to adapt a young girl's house who became unfortunately a quadriplegic through a bad operation. We managed to purchase and obtain through donation uh, about several arms that basically you control it with uh, a little remote and it's like a, it's a robotic arm that helps you do things that many people who are in quadriplegic positions cannot complete. So we've really been doing a lot of fundraising for people who can't afford it and stuff like that. From that, I always kept my positivity and a strong energy. So with working from the foundation at Melio St. Justin, more foundations started coming to me and asking me to be a part of them, helping them raise money for certain things. So a perfect example is Les Coeurs et les Jambes, which is basically a team of runners from Quebec and France who helped me do a marathon across the Moroccan desert. It was a two week marathon, 250 kilometers, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I was one of the first paraplegic children to cross the Moroccan desert. So from there afterwards, I was approached by TED Talk to give a TED Talk where I explained my accident. Mm -hmm. And from there, everything kind of just exploded. And I have constantly people asking me in certain foundations to give speeches and really just spread my positivity to a lot of people who need it. I also work with my, myself and my mother and we basically visit certain people in hospitals and stuff who are very depressed and down and don't have sort of the support I was fortunate enough to have. And basically I kind of help them cheer up and I kind of help them motivate to become better and to heal again. Basketball has really helped me in my recovery because even though I can't exactly play it like I used to, I still put myself out there. So for example, when I first came out of my accident about 2015, a few months later, I joined um, a Quebec wheelchair basketball team. And it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed myself, but it was just hard because with all the school that I missed, I needed to really be studying. So I couldn't really play for the team because it took a lot of time. And basically basketball has really just been there for me because it has shown, it has been sort of like a goal for me. So whenever I think about walking again, I always think about playing basketball again and doing things like that. So by watching basketball, uh, even at my country house, I have a net outside, I shoot around with my friends sometimes. It's really motivated me to my final goal of me walking again and me being able to be at my full potential. Before my accident, I wasn't really into all the hype, hype and stuff. I was wearing regular like little Nike shirts, whatever, but I wasn't too, too crazy into it. But after the accident, once I started really watching a lot, a lot of basketball, I started noticing more and more people at the games, like athletes, celebrities, wearing high-end fashion brands. And I really gained an interest into that, especially because both my parents are in the fashion business. So I was very well connected with that at the same time. And it really, helped me sort of develop a new sort of hobby for me while I was recuperating, not being able to play basketball at the full potential. It really helped me see that I can enjoy other things. So fashion played a huge role because it's something I love to be a part of and it's something I love to be involved with and I've started my own business with it of buying and selling. So fashion has really, really played a huge role just as much as basketball in my recovery as well. Being a hype beast in a wheelchair is very interesting because 
So many people are convinced just because I'm in a wheelchair, I can't be wearing hype clothing, which is completely crazy. So what I try to do is I try to sort of put myself out there with the brands that I wear and stuff so I could sort of put an end to the stigma that people in positions like this can't be hype, which is not true. Because I mean, as you can see, I'm in a wheelchair and I'm still wearing hype clothes. I'm still doing cool things, whatever. So. Being a hype beast in a wheelchair has been very interesting and I've gotten super, super positive feedback from it. Everyone's always hyping me up for it and I'm really lucky with the feedback I'm getting. And really what I'm trying to do is just end the stigma that people who are in wheelchairs, who have disabilities, I'm trying to show that just because I'm in a wheelchair doesn't mean I can't be a part of certain groups and certain trends like Stone Island, Yeezy, stuff like that. And I really want to show people that my wheelchair doesn't restrain me from enjoying things like that. All right, Manny, so thanks for letting us uh, show everyone a portion of your collection. It was amazing and also get to know more about you. Um, if you guys did enjoy this video, of course, don't forget to leave a like on it and of course, subscribe to the channel if you guys are new. And uh, if you guys also have any other suggestions, let us know down below. Um, apart from that, it's been your boy Billy, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Cheers.